My name is Ken Coomer, and I'm here in Memphis at Sam Phillips Recording. We're going with the great Eli Paperboy Reed, the Masqueraders, uh, the Hodges Brothers. It's just a star-studded fest, and Matt Ross Bang flying the plane. So life is good here in Memphis. I'm a native Nashvilleian. They call us the unicorn now. And uh, I grew up around music. My dad had a band with Pat Boone, had a radio show, a record deal, the whole nine yards. So growing up there with guitars, just everywhere you'd walk in our house. So growing up in a musical family was really special to me. And he turned me on to a lot of old country music that I really took for granted till I turned probably 21 or something like that. But being around music, growing up in Nashville, my dad used to go see Hank Williams when he was 14 years old. They'd sneak him in the back of the Opry. So just hearing these stories now, and he's still alive. He's 84 years old. He's still, or 82, he didn't buy <laughs> had years. But he's still alive, and music is such a big part of his life. He plays bluegrass. So, yeah, music's part of who we are, so... I think if you, I think growing up anywhere, maybe this is anyone, you want to get the hell out of there, you know, and I kind of felt the same way. I always wanted to move to Los Angeles. Maybe it's because I grew up in a period where you watched the Rockford Files and there was sun and beaches and everyone was beautiful. And I spent a lot of time in LA, sort of kind of lived there off and on. But uh, there's so much music happening in Nashville other than what people realize. You know, and now, now more people realize it than ever, but rock and stuff like that. It's not just country or music row country. There's so much music. There are home studios everywhere. Everybody's making music. People are moving there in droves. That, that doesn't address growing up there. So growing up there, you know, I always played in rock bands and, you know, was just anti anything about Nashville country music or what Nashville was known for. But... And there were bands everywhere even then, as I remember, you know, mainly though they were cover bands. So you would find these bands traveling through town or based in somewhere near Nashville that would do like entire sets of Pink Floyd or Yes. And it was just, it was jaw dropping. They were great bands. They just never had, you know, they didn't do the original music thing and get a record deal. But they were, ama I remember they were amazing players and would put on an amazing show. So you know, there were always combos or whatever on the street. Uh, people put little bands together and you'd play, you know, parties. But it, it was the great thing was this is what I remember. You make me think of it is playing music was about playing music for the fun of it, not to get a record deal or get noticed. Or we would get in a basement and play for hours, you know, probably smuggling beer that we shouldn't be drinking. But and just play, just play popular music, make up songs. And, and that was the thrill of making music to me was just making music with your friends. You're having a communication. I mean, it's the greatest thing in the world. Still is on stage in the studio. That's part of what it's about. <laughs> does anyone really decide to make music their profession or does music or does the profession make you? I guess what it's just. Uh, I, you know, I knew it. Oh my gosh, man! I knew it seven years old that, you know, when I used to bang on pots and pans, like I said, there were guitars all over the house. I would uh, accompany my dad on this little toy snare drum I had, and then uh, I remember my mother got called over to. I grew up across from an elementary school, and my mother got called because I was banging on the desk, you know, the typical drummer story. And my mother marched over there and said, if my son wants to be a drummer, he'll be a drummer. And then it was kind of like, yeah, that was cool. You know, they always wanted me to get a college degree, which I did, but I always knew what I wanted to do. I quit, I quit college three times, no, twice to go out on the road with bands. So I was on the six year plan, but I made the promise to them. So I did it, I finished. And then it was just like, I went out and starved in punk rock bands until I found other bands, which led to other bands, and then sort of became my career. So, you know, I feel very, very fortunate. But as my dad always said, it's not luck, you make your luck. And I like that saying, so.
you got to be prepared for the opportunity when it happens, obviously. And, you know, timing is right and everything, but, yeah, I love it. I mean, I make records, I produce records, I play drums on records. I, I have the greatest job in the world, basically. <laughs> I had left the band that I was in. We had parted ways. And I sort of had that come to Jesus moment <laughs> where I got called to play with some uh, some guy in town. And I got a call from another guy that was in a known band saying they pay really great and you know it's terrible music, come do it. You know, <laughs> that's just not really where you want to go, but we all have rent and mortgages. So I did it and uh, I agreed to it, so I'm outside of the club. We're about to play, and I just went outside to sort of look up at the at the at the stars and say, "Is this really it? Is this is this is this what I'm going to do right now for a while?" And I heard this kid playing across the street at a coffee house. That's how I became a producer because I went and saw him. He blew my mind. I wrote my number and name on a napkin. Didn't drop any band names or anything. He called me. I did his. Uh, I went in and did his demos with an engineer. And I, you know, from being on the road forever with a band that had some credibility, I got to know a bunch of AR people and record companies. So I sent out the stuff and I got amazing responses and turned it into like a bidding war. Unfortunately, the record never came out because he was a bipolar nightmare. But uh, this, this great friend of mine now, Patrick Clifford, who's worked with a lot of different record companies. He's in Nashville, and, and he's just an old soul music guy. I, I love him to death. And, you know, I was waiting to hear who was going to produce the record. And he said, why don't you do it? I was like, okay, I will do it. <laughs> and I did. And I, you know, I had a budget. I called in M. McClagan from The Faces Played Keys. I had Peter Stroud on guitar for Cheryl Crow's band and Audley Freed. It was in the Black Crows at the time. And then I had Taras uh, Ponenek on bass. And then I needed a drummer. The story's going way too long. I needed a drummer, so I called Steve Jordan. He was booked. I called, you know, I had a budget. Like, they gave me a checkbook and told me to make a record. I'm a fan of musicians, so I called the ones I wanted. I called uh, Pete Thomas. He was out with Elvis Costello. Not to drop names, but, I, you know, I got to call these famous drummers. Matt Chamberlain was booked, all these people. So then uh, I got Charlie Drayton, which turned out to be the greatest thing in the world, because, man, he was a bad mother. So he played on half the record, and I played on the other half, drumming. And then our bass player, Taraz, had to go back on tour, so he left while Charlie's waiting around. We're listening to tracks back, and they sound amazing at Blackbird. We were like the first band ever to record at Blackbird, as the first artist. And uh, Vance is there, and... Uh, Taras said, I mean, not Taras, uh, Charlie Drayton said, you mind if I take a pass at this song? On bass! And it blew my mind. The guy is a consummate musician. So that, that was my foray into producing. And from there, I always loved being in studios. You know, the, the battle I had was being on the road and being in the studio. I'd miss out playing on records from being out on the road. You know, by, it's always trying to find that balance. So now... I, I rarely play out live. I miss it like anybody does, but I love being in the studio. So I built one, <laughs> which is a, a an endeavor, but I have no regrets. It's been great. It's called Cartoon Moon, and I built it. I went through the stress and the anxiety of uh, reading all the books on physics of studios and this and that. And then I went through four different contractors because contractors sometimes don't tell the truth about what license they have and what they can build. And then uh, I was playing on a record and the bass player was, uh, the bass player used to be in, uh, with uh, Nicolette Larson and Vince Gill. Great player, just got tired of chasing the almighty uh, sideman dollar. Became a contractor and he said, I asked him, I said, do you have a contractor that you trust, you know? And he said, well, what about me? And I said, well, have you ever built a studio? He said, no. He said, we'll do it together. It'll be great. <laughs> so, so I went through all this stress reading the books, and he and I talked. And then he said, we threw the books away. We're like, what are our favorite studios? They're in office buildings and, and houses and, you know, Motown. If you've been to Motown, it's a, it's a big house, man. 
you know, and then if you go down to fame, it's in a terrible office building. So we did that. We made, you know, non-parallel walls and we built another house. And that's my studio. And it's vibing and I love it. And it's been great. I work with different artists and bands and uh, I make records. That's really what I do. Uh, my studio's really not far from my house, like walking distance. <clears throat> so I'll take my kiddo to the bus. I have a seven year old, take him to the bus, come back, get breakfast. And then I go down to the studio and just, and just work. I'm either editing stuff or putting pre-mixes together or trying to mix something or uh, recording stuff or laying down drums for other artists from out of the country. And it's just, every day is different. That, and that's what I really dig about it is, uh, I can have a full tracking session with a band. I can be building a record with just an artist and then bringing in people to Overdub. That's what I'm doing this week. And uh, it's great. And I love going through artists' songs and making them better with them. And you know, it's just that big communication thing. And that's what Matt does so well. Like you don't even know Matt's doing anything. But at the end of the day, he does a lot. You know, he just makes it feel so comfortable. And, and that's what I try to do as well is, you know, if you can't have fun making records, get out. You know, I mean, what are we doing? It's, it's the greatest job in the world if that's what you dreamed about when you were a kid looking at Circus Magazine. So enjoy it, man. You know, it's a, I had a great engineer tell me one time, I got pretty stressed about something. He pulled out a CD and goes, this is what we're doing, man. We're not we're not splitting atoms. This is it. This is it. Doesn't matter. And I love that philosophy. So have fun and try things. Think about the Beatles, how they recorded, and they had the guys in the tape off white suits running around going, "Oh my God, you're overdriving these compressors." You know, everyone knows those stories. But try stuff. It's great. I do it all the time. I plug pedals into things that you'd never plug pedals into because. I'm a drummer, man. What do I know? <laughs> you know, I don't care if I get a tape loop. Let's let's sample the tape loop. So it's fun. I, I plan to do this until, you know, I drop dead. I was in a band called Clock Hammer out of Nashville, and it was sort of a punk rock fusion band. Uh, really great live band, I thought. And uh, we just lived on the road. That was it. And then Mike Watt from Firehose kind of adopted us, as he does certain bands that he loves, and took us out on tours. And it was great. You know, I mean, we starved a lot. But, you know, if, if you're really into this and this is all you want to do in life, you're going to go through that, more than likely, I would think. And, and it builds character, you know. We became a great live band because all we wanted to do was play, and that's all we did. We'd practice and we'd play. I've never practiced so much in a band in all my life. But from that, uh, I joined Uncle Tupelo and did uh, some tours with that band and then made the record Anodyne, which was a blast. And then that band soon splintered, as as many people know, into Sunvolt and Wilco, and I was in Wilco. And that was a fun ride. I have no regrets. I got to see the world, play on records, play for a lot of fans, do all the television. You know, I'm, I'm very uh, humbled by that experience, but uh, I thought it was a great band then, and it's a great band now. It'll continue to be a great band. I miss my friends that were in that band that are either not alive anymore or moved on, but, you know, bands are like forced families. I don't know how any band stays together anyway, unless you just grow up together, like, or you're like U2 and, or Los Lobos, and, you know, they're, they're like family, so... I probably produce a little bit more, but I play on a lot of stuff I produce. So I don't have to, but I wind up doing that a lot for whatever reason. It comes with the, with the package or someone wants it because of that. I make a fair amount of trips to work with Matt in Memphis and those are always great records and they're great. So it's just been one after another. I love it. It's not a bad drive. I come up, we make music, I get to work with great musicians. So uh, that's been good. You know, when, when you start producing, a lot of producers won't call you to play on their record. And I, I'm not bitter about it because they think you're going to play producer instead of the drummer, 
But once they figure out that I have fun just playing, I don't have to deal with any of the headache and I just get to be the drummer. That's a great thing. I have no problem with that. So, yeah, it's been fun. So I'd say I probably a little bit, I produce a little bit more than I play drums. So. Not at all. I watch people forever. And I, I still don't call myself an engineer by any stretch. I can work a Pro Tools rig. Sometimes I'll hit a, you know, a hill on that too and have to, have to call someone that's a genius at it. But, uh, you know, I just know what I, I know what I want to hear in my head. Or I know what I hear in my head and I know what I want to hear. So it's been really nice to learn over the last 10 years how to get that across because that's the frustrating part. It's trying to really... Take it from here to your head to 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 the speakers, but but it's been a great journey, man. I love it. I was gonna do it regardless. You know, you know what I mean. Like when one band broke up, I was like instantly like, okay, now how do I move this forward? How, how does it become a leap forward? And luckily, who knows why? It's always been a it's always been a move up. So that's been that's been great. From Clockhammer to Tupelo to Wilco, and then playing on records of artists I really respect, Steve Earle and Emmy Lou, and you know just working with Billy Bragg, who I love to death, and you know it's 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 been great. Well, the first recording I ever did, I played drums on. It wasn't engineering or anything, and I thought it was great. And then if I listen to it today, it makes my skin want to crawl. <laughs> but isn't that normal? Isn't that everybody? But, you know, I used to make those recordings on, like, cassette and boom boxes and how a boom box would distort. And I was like, this is badass. I love it. And those still sound good. Anything I can do to try to learn a little bit more about this craft, because, you know, that's your brain, man. I'm not 20 years old anymore. I want to learn forever. I'm taking bass lessons, you know, I'm a frustrated bass player. So I played bass on a record I produced. That was my greatest joy of six months that I can say, I played bass on it. You know, I love bass players. So I didn't answer your question, but the whole, the whole point is, uh, I try to be, I'm really proud of what I do because I feel like I, I go the extra effort. You know, I, I never, I never want to be this, I've worked with guys that just phone it in, just get to the finish line, next, here we go. You know, your name's on it too as a producer, engineer, musician, so have some pride, you know. It's, I mean, it's people's life, it's, it's someone's life work, you know, that they're presenting to you, and that means a lot to me. I mean, you know, you got to care. The groove is all that matters. That's my musical advice to my young self. It's not about busy licks. It's not about anything. It's all about pocket and groove. If people can't move to it, who gives a shit? No, this is my business advice to myself, my younger self. The attorney will be expensive. The attorney will be worth it. That's my main thing. And don't feel like contracts need to be uncomfortable. Like get the business. I, I worked with a pretty famous musician. I will not say his name here, but we were we were on the phone negotiating price. I, I was producing. He was in New York. He lives in New York. And uh, I said, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he said, well, let's get the business out of the way so we can talk about the music. I thought that was the greatest line ever. So we did. We got the business out of the way, and then it was all about music. There was never this uncomfortable little seeping in vibe about, oh, man, God, we haven't talked about the contract or the terms or, you know, uh, it's unfortunate that contracts are a part of this job, but they really are. I mean, having paper with people will protect yourself. It doesn't have to be a 50-page contract, but you've got to have, you got to understand writing. you got to understand something about publishing because that's where the money is. And, you know, we all want to get paid. So, yeah, pay the attorney. He is worth Find an attorney you trust. One that goes to lunch with you and doesn't expect you to pick up the lunch. And then hire that guy or girl and, uh, 
you know, you need an attorney before a manager, before an agent. You know, they can be your friend too. If you're honest with them and you tell them, I don't have a lot of money, but I got a contract here. The first contract I ever signed with a punk band, they, they had, we walked into the attorney's office, a high rise attorney, fancy attorney, and we you know, had dreadlocks down to my butt and we would look like we were, we crawled from under a rock. And at the end of it, he did our deal. And he's like, you know what, boys, this one's on me. I mean, you could tell we didn't have anything. So I thought that was pretty cool. He's a friend to this day. Uh, attorneys, they matter. Use your ears. It doesn't have to be about looking at screens. Sometimes when, when I'm working with uh, young artists and I see that they've grown up with Pro Tools and GarageBand, and they're all about blips and whatever on the screen, I'll take a sheet and cover it up and watch their face drop to the floor. They don't know what to think. They don't know where to look. I'm like, <laughs> ears, baby, ears, <laughs> use your ear. Not sound like Grandpa New Wave, but it's about listening, you know? We can read all the VU meters and Pro Tools screens and logic, and but if, if you can't hear it with your ears, because you gotta hear it in the studio, in earbuds, you know, in your car. I mean, music is different, and I know, you know, we're listening to MP3s and we're streaming and all this, but let, let's let's stop looking at screens so much.